So as I mentioned to the children, for as long as I can remember, All Saints Sunday has always been my favorite observance of the Christian year, um, at least since I could read. I'll explain why in a second. Um, and really, even more so than any of the traditional favorites like Easter or Christmas. You know, naturally I loved receiving gifts on Christmas, um, but I wouldn't call that necessarily like an in-the-church tradition like what I explained to the children. There's just something about All Saints. And as I mentioned to them, All Saints is a tradition that really has come to define us as Christian people. And it helps us to remember that our personal and traditional faith has an origin, like it all came from somewhere. And it's very important to remember that that origin is fundamentally about people, about people. Now, I have always been fascinated by the Christian martyrs. When I was in my early teens, uh, I was uh, told to check out uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs, which may or may not be the best text for an uh, early teen uh, to read, but um, it fascinated me. And I became very fascinated with the idea of what a martyr was. Now, uh, and be honest, does anyone here not know what a martyr is? Yeah. Okay, we don't really share it with the kids much because death can be gruesome and especially the death of a martyr can be very gruesome as well. So the simplest way I can put it is a martyr is a brave soul, a person who laid down their lives in defense of the faith in a society that sought to execute them as enemies of the state, which means that the government opposed Christianity for some reason. So the earliest martyrs in the Christian church were, were existent during the Roman Empire. There was something about Christianity that was considered to just be an offshoot of Judaism, and that wasn't legal in Roman society. So to stamp out this illegal sect, um, many early Christians were martyred. Um, you may have heard uh, tales of the Roman Colosseum and how um, many uh, martyrs were uh, executed there, all because they had broken the law. But the, many of them, not all of them, but many of them were given the chance to say, I'm not a Christian, which is obviously a very personal and troubling thing for someone to have to go through if they have a very strong faith. And if they said they weren't a Christian, then they would be spared execution. And there was something about this idea that really got to me because it occurred to me that if it hadn't been for those early martyrs, what I call the progenitors of our faith, if they had simply said, okay, we're just gonna let it go and move on, well, that would have set a very different direction for the Christian church. And I don't know that any of us would be sitting here or that this sanctuary would even exist on these grounds. So everything comes from someplace. Now there's an old saying, the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good people to do nothing. I'm sure you've heard that again and again, and frankly, it comes up a lot during our election cycle. Um, while it is definitely a saying that um, it has its weight and it has its merit, uh, I, I just, I don't think there's any way for someone with an agenda to really spin that saying when it comes to the Christian martyrs. There is, you may have heard of something like modern religious persecution. That's something, a uh, concept that I laugh at. I'm sorry if anyone here is sensitive to something like that. I'm not trying to make fun. I'm just trying to say that um, when you really consider the example of the martyrs and what they went through, really look at the Roman Empire and Japan. There's a wonderful book called Silence that I would commend to you. Uh, about two uh, priests, Roman Catholic priests, that attempted to evangelize Japan. Th there's no comparison between what we might now call Christian persecution and something like that. And frankly, um, these honored dead, and that's why All Saints exist, to honor these dead, have been for me a demonstration of God's power. And I think it's a power that helps us to retain our dignity in the most trying of times. Uh, even if we might think ourselves weak. Uh, I used to be, uh, I, I just used to marvel at my mom, at how strong she was. She, she had underwent a lot of suffering in her life, and I'd watch her go through it again and again, and I'd say, Mom, you're very strong. I, I, I wish I could be as strong as you, and she would always say the same thing. She'd say, Leme, 
I'm not strong. I am one of the weakest people I know. I am made strong because God is with me, and God's with you. This strength that God gives us does not depend on our frailty for strength. It does use us as an example. It makes the frail strong. And it does it again and again because it is God's pleasure to manifest power through weakness. That's something that I, I can't even begin to understand about God's nature. Now, this Sunday is also one of those observances that reminds us about how blessed we are to have been the recipient of the good faith that so many people have had in God. When I consider that, you know, their faith, by extension, through me, that they took the time to even pour that into me, it marvels me. But you know, there are plenty of people that I may never meet that also poured into me, people you will never meet, that poured into you with their good intentions, these countless faithful that devoted their lives, their money, their energy, to an enterprise that formed us and shaped us into the people that we are. It really still blows me away, even all these years now, that our church can work toward the good of others in a way that, they, that we might never see while we're still alive. But the effect is there, beyond death. Now there's one more tradition we commemorate today, and that's the way that the people in our lives have given our faith its shape. Mentors, friends, colleagues, family. And I want to ask you, you know, take it or leave it, but you might consider doing yourself a favor today if you can set aside the time. I want you to just take a moment and to look back on the course of your life and consider your story of faith. You know, it really shouldn't take you very long to think about some of the people that influenced what you believe in or might have even shaped the reasons why you're in church today. Some of those folks might even still be alive. Tell them, tell them that they were an influence on you. But today we're gonna to focus on those who have gone on to glory and indeed to their heavenly reward. Do we have any recovering Catholics in the congregation today? Okay. <laughs> Or current Catholics, that's fine too. You're all welcome. Um, for any recovering Catholics in the congregation today, or really anyone who's interested in understanding what United Methodists mean when they talk about saints, let me share with you what I know about this tradition. So we believe that through the power of grace, so that's God's gift of unconditional love, we are connected to the body of Christ. You've probably heard that term used a lot in church, the body of Christ. And that connection persists even through death. Now that you might not have been aware of. That's what we believe, that the connection persists even in death. And it's rooted in scripture, this idea. Now an old way of describing this belief, and this is a really old idea, uh, is to divide the church into two parts. So the church militant, and the church victorious. Now the church militant is the whole body of living believers striving as we do against the power of sin. That's why we called it the church militant. The church victorious represents the entirety of Christians in the past and in the future. Those who have gone on to God and those who will. And it's a term that represents both those who are with the Lord now and those who will be with the Lord at the end of days. And that's where the victory comes from. Now, no one really knows what happens when you die. I certainly don't. And I'm not sure I want to know. But death doesn't rob the living of the influence of those that have gone on. Now, Jesus, as you heard, was once asked a, a gotcha-type question by a religious scholar who was trying to show him up that really illustrates this concept. So the scholar was fundamentally asking Jesus about marriage and the afterlife. And it was one of those classic wise guy kind of like Sunday school questions somebody might ask like, and this is a Simpsons reference, it's not mine, could God microwave a burrito so hot that God couldn't eat it? or something like that. 
Now, Jesus was asked, if a woman got married and her husband died, and then remarried, and then that husband died, and so on and so on, whose wife will she be in the afterlife? It's a pretty good question, if you ask me. Well, this presented the Savior with an opportunity to teach a beautiful lesson about God, and it serves as the foundation for the tradition I shared with you last week. You might have seen the ofrenda out front, and this was about el Dia de los Muertos, the Day of the Dead. So Jesus just dodges the question entirely, and he shares his thoughts about God's nature. He asks the scholar and the gathered crowd, because there was a crowd in front of them, about why we call God the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when those men seem to be dead. I mean, we can all understand what a tradition is, and it's tradition to name God that way, but why? If they're dead, their influence is gone. They don't feel, they don't think, they can't talk to us. So if the dead are dead, here's a question. Does God stop being their God? In the Jewish understanding, the answer is uh, no, absolutely not. God is God of everything. You know? And Jesus shares that the correct answer is no. Jesus believes in something called the resurrection of the dead, a concept we're well acquainted with because we believe the cross is empty for a reason, but back in his day was a big debate about what happens when the Lord finally comes to redeem all of creation. Do those who died in the old creation, in the suffering, do they come back or do they stay dead? And so Jesus says that to God, these vaunted patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, though we consider them to be dead, to God they're alive. All are alive. And this really drives the point home that things we might consider dead, well, they might not be so dead after all. And if we're going to consider them dead, well, there are consequences for beliefs like that. They drive behavior. Think about every time you've been to a funeral and seen someone weeping over the dead. You might have been one of those people weeping over your dead. It is traumatic. It is awful. And the reason it's awful is because we believe fundamentally that a connection has been severed through death, that everything that that person that died was and meant to us is gone forever or at least forever to us. And it creates an enormous amount of grief and suffering. It alters the courses of lives. It drives people mad. But what if we were willing to indulge a little uncertainty about our beliefs in dead things and consider that maybe they aren't dead? Maybe they're just different. We see it in nature all the time. There's a reason why we've put all saints in this time of the year in the fall. When you turn and you see the leaves turn, they're beautiful colors here. In California, we don't have the benefit of beautiful foliage like that, um, where I'm from. Um, but we, we do know what it is to see nature renew itself in a cycle each and every year. Spring, winter, fall. We see those things happen. It's in nature. We see the very animals do their thing. Bears will hibernate, conserve energy so that they can rise again in the spring when the snows melt and the ice thaws. Yes, things are different, lamentably different in death, for sure. Because the connection that defined our relationship to our honored dead has certainly changed, absolutely, maybe even unacceptably so. I mean, if you're used to talking to somebody day in and day out, or learning from them, or receiving love from them, and now they're gone, yeah, like, that's pretty unacceptable. But that does not mean that their future is fixed. You don't know that. I don't know that. I have faith. I think we, and this is not me prosecuting people, but I think we want to believe that the only two things in life that are certain are death and taxes, as the old saying goes. I think we want to believe those things. I think it helps us in some way. 
It's simpler to our psyche to just move on. Like that's a healthy thing to do. How many times were you told in the course of your life, hey, you need to move on? As a believer in the All Saints traditions, I don't think moving on in that sense is the right thing to do. There's nothing about the condition of that altar right now that says anything about moving on. No, I, I think we dishonor our honored dead by moving on. It trivializes their impact on our lives. You know, sure, grief can in some cases lead to mental health problems. Absolutely, there is such a thing as obsessive behavior and its consequences, but you know, moving on, when people say you need to move on, it's not really about that, not really. Frankly, I think people just want an end to their emotional discomfort. And like so many people who encounter emotional discomfort, they turn to easy solutions in an attempt to numb or deny the pain as if you could medicate the pain. There are just some pains that we cannot medicate. I mean, even the people around us may leave us to our pain after a while because they don't want to be personally inconvenienced. You probably know what that felt like the last time you lost someone that you cared about deeply. It probably changed a relationship or ended one. But All Saints is exactly the opposite of moving on. It is designed to connect us to our saints beyond our misunderstandings of death and turn them into the not so dead after all. And so we do more than remember our loved ones today. They are not memories. We honor the ones who taught us a deeper understanding of God's love, perhaps even in ways they might not have even known when they were teaching us and sharing with us. But it certainly formed us into what we are today. Those are the saints. That's what a saint is. Sometimes we say, we call someone a saint and it makes it seem like they're perfect. No, they're not perfect. But they put us on a path. That's what a saint is. In a world where it seems so difficult, if not impossible, to change anyone's mind about most anything, it's my firm belief that the reason our saints shape us, why that can even happen, is because they are manifestations of God's holiness, which is really just another way of talking about what God wants for this world. They're like windows into the heart of God. We get a picture. And each window we peer through gives us a bigger picture. You know, holiness, I believe, affects us deeply for this reason. It inspires the very best in us. Before I met my wife and my children, I was a very arrogant man. I still am a lot of the time. Before I met my wife, I was very selfish. Before I, I met my children, I was very selfish. I had to learn to be selfless for them. It brought out the best in me. And we have a name for this phenomenon as United Methodists. We call it prevenient grace. It's the grace of God that goes before us, even before we came to an awareness of it, an awareness of a loving God that loves us. And we glimpse grace in the example of our saints. Now, while we mourn their passing, as you learned last week, about Dia de los Muertos, we can move that awful memory from being an occasion of loss and sadness and trauma to one of warmth and humor, even humor. That work is what holiness is all about. It's about transformation. This power of God, it's about transformation. One of the best descriptions of holiness that I have ever heard comes from an op-ed columnist. Uh, his name is David Brooks. So he talks about how Americans are obsessed with the pursuit of happiness, but we often end up in that pursuit feeling 
empty or alone, maybe even without meaning. And people will shoot for happiness, but the truth is, is that we feel most formed through suffering. You know, happiness, happiness gets you thinking about how am I going to maximize my benefits? Difficulty and suffering send you on a completely different course. The right response to pain is not pleasure. As I said, you can't medicate some forms of pain. The right response to pain is not pleasure, as so many do, uh, to deal with emotional discomfort. It's holiness. You place the hard experiences in a moral context and try to redeem something bad by turning it into something sacred. And in the process, we may not come out healed or happy, but we do come out different than we were before. The darkness of our grief becomes a bit less dark in degrees. There's always going to be suffering in the world until kingdom come, or whatever that means, whatever that is, or how it looks like. It is so easy to feel a sense of despair about that. When is all this injustice and pain going to end? It almost makes us believe that suffering is just not something that we can deal with. And I'm sure every one of us here have felt something like that, that overwhelm. But it's just not true. It's not true. We can do something. Do you think our saints would tell us we can't do anything to bring the knowledge of God's grace to our world? That all this bad can one day be redeemed into something holy? Those are not the saints that I know. That is not the example that they gave me. Sometimes we're left with no choice but to face our suffering head on. No, head on. Sometimes for years. And when our peace does come at last, and it will, oh my God, if you could take one thing away from what I'm saying to you, if you're looking for peace, it will come. It will come. You just have to give it a little more time. It will come. If we can do it, if we can face it head on and claim our peace, my God, that is a holy thing. It's wonderful when it happens. That is how God's love is revealed, through redemption, through the turning about, through transformation. That is how God turns death into life. This is what our saints already know, by the way as they have experienced a level of joy that we can only contemplate now where we are. It's as the old song goes about the church's one foundation. Yet she on earth hath union with God the three in one, and mystic sweet communion with those whose rest is one. O happy ones and holy, Lord give us grace that we, like them, the meek and lowly on high may dwell with thee. To God be the glory, and amen.